Happy Friday, everyone. I'm going to be speaking with Phyllis Z today. Hey, Phyllis, how are you? Hello. Hi, Ricardo. I'm well, thank you. Well, that was, uh, I'm glad we got that worked out. Thank you for, thank you for putting up with Instagram. I know you're not an Instagram user. A lot of people aren't. So anyway, I appreciate all the time you, you, you put into that. Thank you very much for having me. Now, of course, I'm going to do a, um, just a quick intro, uh, just while everyone's logging on. Uh, so today we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Phyllis Z. Uh, she's a world renowned sleep expert. Uh, she's the director of the center for circadian and sleep medicine. Uh, Chief of Sleep Medicine and Professor of Neurology at Northwestern. Uh, she oversees a cutting-edge program in sleep and circadian rhythm research with pivotal findings that have paved the way for innovative approaches to improve sleep. She's the founder of the first circadian medicine clinic in the USA, where novel treatments are available for patients with sleep disorders. Dr. Z has authored more than 300 peer-reviewed articles, reviews, and chapters on the topic of sleep. She has also trained over 50 pre-doctoral and post-doctoral students and has mentored numerous faculty members throughout the country. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, fellow of the American Academy of Neurology, and member of the American Neurological Association. She is past president of the Sleep Research Society, past president of the Sleep Research Society Foundation, and past chair of the NIH Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board. Uh, she has a very uh, stellar background, as you can see. She had her MD, PhD at Chicago Medical School, internship and residency in neurology at Northwestern, uh, followed by um, a fellowship in neurobiology at Northwestern and a second fellowship in sleep medicine at the University of Chicago. So with all that in mind, we're very lucky to have her here today. And we're going to be talking about the ever critical question of why we sleep. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Z, for, for, uh, for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for that kind um, introduction. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's quite impressive. Uh, let's just start, I guess, with a very basic question. You know, shortly, why do humans sleep? Why do, why do animals sleep in general? So I think the answer to that may depend on what are the functions of sleep. I used to think there was a function, like why do you sleep? But there's multiple functions of sleep, and this is really an evolving science. Clearly, is to stay awake during the day. I mean, that's the most obvious so that you're not sleepy, uh, neuropsychological performance. But I think lately in the last maybe two decades, and especially in the last decade, we're beginning to recognize that sleep is of the brain, it's produced by the brain, but it's for the entire body. So it really affects uh, overall health, not just well-being, but cardiometabolic regulation, uh, neurological regulation, even your neurons sleep. And in some ways you can think about every cell of your body actually has a rest and active cycle. And during these processes, proteins are being made, uh, proteins are being degraded, gene expression is altering. So the function of sleep is really, really very broad for the health of the organism, of the entire organism. And people talk about phases of sleep. Can you just quickly summarize what the different phases of sleep are? So there are what we call different stages of sleep, and that's all recorded by the EEG or the brain waves. So those could include what we will call it. Let's start with the lightest stage of sleep, which is at what we call N1. That's when you're kind of drowsy, and you, you, you may even think that you may have heard something, but you're not quite deeply asleep yet. Probably the real first stage of sleep when somebody is really less uh, responsive to their environment is what we call N2 sleep. And there are very specific characteristics in the brain waves. They get slowed down a little bit more. They get this spindle activity. And then we go into the N3 sleep, which is the deepest stage of sleep. Your brain waves are quite slow uh, during that period. And those three stages are called a non-REM sleep. And then there's this really interesting stage called REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep, where we tend to do most of our dreaming, but not exclusively. So your body is somewhat paralyzed intermittently, but your brain is actually at, almost as active as when you were in the lighter stages of sleep. So that's, those are your, I would say like your four different types of stages of sleep. And so like you said, sleep, uh, REM is just so interesting in the, in the fact that, that you're in your deepest sleep 
but your eyes are moving rapidly, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up. Do we know what exactly is happening during REM sleep to your brain and to your body? So your brain waves are actually not as deep as you would think. Your deepest stage of sleep is N3 sleep. Your, your brain is actually relatively activated uh, during REM sleep. If you look at PET scans and you look at how much glucose is going into your brain during REM sleep, it's actually higher than you would expect. So it's an active stage, but it's nice that it's really important that you can't really move because imagine if you could act out your dreams. It's also the stage of sleep that appears important for emotional regulation, whereas the Deep sleep, like the N3 sleep, may be important for things like memory consolidation. So I think it's really a good point that you're making, Ricardo, that different stages of sleep may actually also have slightly different functions. And you mentioned in, that, that we dream in REM sleep, is that correct? Mostly, yes. We tend to dream mostly in REM sleep, although you can dream also in some of the lighter stages of sleep, like N2 sleep, but predominantly in REM sleep. Got you. And have they done any scientific studies looking at the purpose of dreams, why certain people remember many of their dreams, some people never remember their dreams? It seems very variable. Yeah, typically, I, I tell my patients, you probably should shouldn't remember too many of your dreams uh, in normal sleep because you remember your dream if you're waking up out of a dream. And that tends to be in that early morning hour when you're about to wake up. Most of us remember our last dream because up out of REM sleep, which is a lighter stage of sleep. Now, if you remember too much of your dreams, uh, that means you're probably waking up either because of a sleep disorder like sleep apnea or maybe very commonly in these dream anxiety disorders, like PTSD, for example. Uh, very vivid dreaming. Patients with narcolepsy have very vivid dreaming. That tends to be, we, we can remember our dreams, but it shouldn't be something that keeps waking you up from it. Interesting. Um, and then you were talking about how important sleep is just for overall general health. Talk about what chronic sleep deprivation, you know, sleeping three, four, five hours a night only. What does that do not only to the brain, but to the overall physiology of your body? Yeah, even even short term sleep deprivation, just for a few days of, you know, three or four hours can increase insulin resistance, increase your glucose levels, increase blood pressure uh, during the night. And in the long term, all of these can, of course, uh, have consequences for increasing the risk for cardiovascular and metabolic disorders, neurological disorders. It's really kind of cool that more recently we found that lack of sleep or perhaps fragmented sleep is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. It's increasing your, uh, uh, the, the toxic activity in the brain that is you know, occurring during the day while we're talking it's, it's part of the, for example, something like uh, during sleep, you, your glymphatic system, which is the system in the brain that allows you to flush out these large toxins and molecules like A-beta amyloid, which is what what's accumulates in Alzheimer's disease, could be impaired with lack of sleep. Very interesting. What, what do you recommend to your patients? What, what, how much sleep should an average adult human get per night? An adult human should get about seven to nine hours of sleep, and within that range are younger people, probably, you know, more in the area of nine hours, and then we get to the older age group, somewhere around seven hours. So that's, in general, a, a good rule of thumb. So you're saying that as you get older, you need less sleep? You don't need less sleep, but it appears that the capacity to sleep all at once seems to diminish as you get older. Older people then, of course, may nap a little bit more, for example. So if you look across the 24 hours, you're still within that range of seven to maybe eight hours. Got you. And, you know, the thing that you were talking about in terms of if you, if you have good sleep, what, you're talking about sleep being the part where your brain is cleaning up, basically, all the metabolic activity that goes on during the day. It's, uh, it's the time to essentially purge your brain of any toxins? 
pretty much uh it's like the toilet flushing right it it, <laughs> it, it it is pretty much one there's a lot of sweeping going on during the night and then it flushes it out it's it's really uh it's a good rinse okay and you mentioned naps i, I naps i've heard I've heard things that naps are good for you. I've heard things naps are bad for you. What's your opinion in terms of taking naps? Should we, and if we do, should they be power naps? Should they be an hour? What's, what's your recommendation? Yeah, there's a good and bad of naps. If you nap because you're so sleepy during the day and you're not planning on napping, that's bad. That's indicating there's something wrong, all right? Whether it's you're not getting enough sleep or there's some illness that's uh, comorbid with this. However, studies have shown that if you uh, structure a nap every day or you plan naps for an hour uh, and usually in that early afternoon period after lunch, the siesta, that that actually may be good for you. It allows your brain to rest and also allows you to carry on your activities later into, into the day. So it's really whether your naps are planned or not. And power naps are really interesting because that means you're, 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 you're doing like maybe a, a 15 to 30 minute nap. And the reason why that may be good for those of us who are quite busy is that it doesn't allow you to get into the very deep stages of sleep. Because as you know, if you sleep too long during the day, it's hard to wake up. You feel mm -hmm. worse because you get into that and three sleep, the deeper stages of sleep. And then speaking about how different chemicals can affect sleep, people want to know in terms of how does caffeine, alcohol, marijuana, how do these, how do these, you know, chemicals slash drugs, how do they affect overall sleep? Yeah, caffeine is our biggest wake drug, right, uh, in, in, in the world, actually. Caffeine actually is an adenosine receptor antagonist. And what it does is it antagonizes the build you know the so when you're awake um, one of the neurotransmitters that increases is adenosine so it's blocking the effect of adenosine which makes you sleepy so it's 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 great uh, and from that sense but people have different half-lives I mean not the people have different reactions to caffeine so we'd say please avoid that let's say in the afternoon if because uh, it can last for four or more hours the, you know the the effect as far as something like marijuana, which is common, or, or CBD, um, the, the effects are kind of mixed with that. It does indeed, I think, help people with anxiety relax a little bit. But in the long run, I don't think if you look at the objective um, EEG readings, it seems to sometimes actually, disturb, it can also disturb sleep. So it's kind of a mixed uh, picture here with regards to that. And what about alcohol? Well, alcohol, if you could, alcohol can help you fall asleep, but it will disrupt your sleep once that alcohol is, is, is gone. And in fact, it can also increase sleep apnea, which is not good. And you can have this, once the alcohol is out of your system, it can cause a rebound of REM sleep because it will suppress REM sleep and also the restorative stages of sleep. So it is not... I highly, re not, I highly recommend not using alcohol as a sleep aid. Got you. You know, it seems like sleep doesn't get the right attention that it deserves, meaning that people focus on exercise, diet, in terms of overall health, but there isn't really a big push towards emphasizing quality of sleep towards overall health. Um, in your opinion, is sleep just as important as diet and exercise in terms of overall health? Absolutely. It's, it's not just as important, but because I am biased, I think it's perhaps even more important. And the reason for that is that there are studies that show that the lack of sleep will drive your choice of food, for example. It will drive your choice of exercise. If you sleep better, you're more likely to exercise during the day. We've done studies that, that basically show this bi-directional relationship. So it's really a a you know a base in my opinion for nutrition and for act physical activity levels so if sleep is so important what are your recommendations for good quote sleep hygiene uh you know certain people have trouble sleeping they sleep you know on and off uh they have insomnia 
Um, what are your recommendations for overall improvement of sleep hygiene? Well, if you have insomnia uh, or a sleep disorder, please see your doctor uh, about that. But for those who are not, you know, who just have sleep disturbances, they're having regular sleep, maintain a regular sleep-wake schedule. Do not deviate more than an hour uh, on a weekday and definitely not more than two hours on a weekend because that's going to affect your circadian uh, rhythms. Get plenty of light exposure during the day. Minimize light exposure in the evening, two to three hours before bedtime. Do not eat too close to bedtime. My rule is two to three hours of dim light, two to three hours of stop eating before, before bedtime. Those can all affect your ability. And, and I think most importantly for most of it, for us is to prioritize your sleep. Think about that as your, your nutrition, about your exercise and to prioritize and allow enough, like at least seven to eight hours of time in bed for sleep. That's great to hear, because I certainly, I, I don't think there's enough, you know, attention given to quality of sleep. And, and I know that, you know, like as a doctor, I'm sure just like you remember being a resident, a lot of sleep deprivation, not a lot of focus in terms of the long-term health effects of poor sleep. So it's good that, that now people are starting to recognize what the detrimental effects are. Um, I know a lot of your research focuses upon um, circadian rhythms. Talk a little bit about the inner sleep drive we have. What are these um, circadian rhythms and what can affect circadian rhythms? So I think in many ways, circadian rhythms is probably the great story of systems biology. As you know, in 2017, the Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of this of the molecular mechanisms or genetic mechanisms that regulate circadian rhythms. So the word circadia means approximately 24 hours is endogenous. All, almost every cellular process, every biological process exhibits these near 24 hour rhythms. And these need to be aligned with the rotation of the earth on its axis, the light dark cycle, our social activity cycles, and any misalignment between those parts can create disease states, just like sleep deprivation. Circadian misalignment increases the risk for cardiovascular disease, increases the risk for metabolic disease uh, and neurological disorders. And circadian rhythms regulate the timing of sleep and wake. So among many, many other physiological rhythms, sleep and wake is one of those physiological rhythms. So you can imagine, in my opinion again, it's top gun. If you mess up circadian rhythms, you're going to mess up sleep uh, as well, in addition to your immune system and all of these other parameters that these genetic clock genes are regulating. And what keeps that rhythm so precise? Is it the light? Is it melatonin? Is it both of them together? What keeps that rhythm precise is the genetic mechanism that's innate in, in, in every cell of our body. So that molecular mechanism of this near 24 hour rhythm, which is made by expression of core clock genes, proteins, all of that cycle is what's really working. And I, I, to me, that's what it is. Now, that's the precision. The light and the melatonin that's been secreted during, you know, by the pineal gland, that keeps the rhythms aligned with your work schedule with your physical light dark cycle schedule so you need to have all of that that machinery is running anyways that clock is running in your body anyways but usually humans it's not exactly 24 hours it runs a little bit longer than 24 hours that's why light melatonin physical activity when you eat becomes hugely important because they're what we call synchronizers for this clock now, what about over-the-counter melatonin? I know that that's a big thing. People think they can take some melatonin and they can just go to sleep. Is that something that's proven or is that placebo? Melatonin is a wonderful, what we call chronobiotic, means that it affects the circadian rhythm. You can use melatonin, but it has to be timed and the smaller dose is better. There's a myth that the more is better. No, the more is not better for sleep. It is not a very good hypnotic medication. You gotta take a lot of it to be hypnotic. But if, for example, if you have trouble falling asleep, 
uh, until like two o'clock in the morning and you can't wake up in the morning and once you fall asleep, you're fine. Maybe you have a circadian rhythm disorder and not a insomnia disorder. And in that case, melatonin time in the evening may be quite effective, but as a sleeping pill, not so much so. Now, someone's asking here about CBD. I know you've mentioned marijuana. Obviously, the two are very closely tied together. Do you guys ever prescribe CBD for people who are having sleep disorders or trouble falling asleep? So I don't prescribe CBD, but I do have patients, of course, who are taking CBD and who say that it's helping with their sleep. And um, I say, okay, um, are you having any problems with it, any side effects? Like I said before, where it's marijuana, CBD, or THC, the, the data is mixed with that. But I think at an individual level, if it's helping you uh, and you're not abusing it, I, I, don't, dis I, I don't disagree with that. Got you. Um, do all animals sleep? All animals sleep, all plants really sleep, all cells sleep, depends on how you define sleep. If you define it by the EG, of course, the cockroach doesn't sleep, nor does it fly. But if you, re if you think of it as like rest, act behaviorally as rest and activity, and really I think the most important definition of sleep is if you deprive of this rest state, the organism needs to recover. There's rebound. And this occurs um, in almost every living uh, organism. Wow, that's actually, I never knew that. So, so even plants are doing their own form of sleeping. I mean, think what the plant, right? In, at night, some plants like the mimosa plant, their leaves go down, right? They, they close their leaves, they open up because they're opening up to get that light, to get the photosynthesis. And this is occurring. Even in, if you put that plant in total darkness, it's not following the light. It's got an intrinsic circadian rhythm. Wow. And even fish, even fish that are swimming in the ocean, they, everyone's, they all sleep. Absolutely. And in fact, many of our really basic research is done in the fish, in the zebra fish, because you can actually, you know, it's almost translucent. You can see all the, um, and flies sleep. Mm-hmm. If you define it without that EEG that we tend to think about it, you know, like the stages of sleep. Yeah. Of course, of course. Um, you know, last question, just because I find it so interesting. But, you know, do you think that over the millions of years that we would have evolved to require less sleep? Sleep is still, you know, a third of our lives. Um, you know, do you feel like over millions of years, because evolutionarily you're not getting much done during that time period, that it would continue to shorten down to a very small amount of time needed? Or do you think it's gonna remain one third of our lives need to be recuperating? I think it's gonna remain uh, about one third of our lives because it really hasn't changed all that much. We're getting less sleep because we're depriving ourselves of, of less sleep. And like one of my old you know, professors used to say, you know, if sleep does not serve a vital function or functions, it would be the greatest mistake the evolutionary process has ever made. Because like you said, it is a time where animals are vulnerable, for example, right? To prey and to danger. So, and we're just beginning to understand the multiple um, functions of sleep uh, really just in the last uh, decade. Yeah. And what do you see as the next, let's say, three big breakthroughs when it comes to sleep research, understanding sleep, like in the next 10 to 15 years? What do you predict? I think it's really understanding how the circadian clock system and the sleep-wake system are interrelated because in normal life, that's how they function and how alterations of those. But more importantly, I think it has to do with how can we measure sleep and, and circadian rhythms with, uh, with sensor technology in multiple systems to really understand its effects on health and functioning. But perhaps even more importantly is we need trials. We need to have data that really shows that if you do sleep more, if you get better quality sleep, 
what is that doing to your long-term health? Is it really mitigating, preventing Alzheimer's disease, for example, or decreasing the ability for that? And also, how does that function for healthy aging? Absolutely fascinating. Listen, um, Dr. Z, I'm going to let you go because I know you're super busy. Thank you so much for your time talking about this fascinating topic. Uh, you know, thanks for leading the way in terms of your research uh, and really making sure people understand that sleep is a priority, just like exercise, just like diet for overall well-being. So again, kudos to all your accomplishments. And again, thanks for thanks for coming on board and uh, and just speaking with us today. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for having me and may you all sleep well.